me read to you Titus 1. This came out, actually, I don't think we touched this scripture, but then last night me and Joyce sat and listened to a, um, a Q&A with John MacArthur and John Piper, an hour and 12 minutes of just sweetness. In the, in the latest Shepherds Conference, it was brilliant. Um, and they touched this, and I thought, I'm going to mention this before I start. Titus says this, Paul, a bondservant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time be gone. Listen to this, verse 3. But has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Saviour. Friends, the Lord has ordained the preaching of his word. And it is in that moment to which is supernatural, in fact prophetic, where God breathes. He changes lives. He saves through these means. He edifies his own through these means. And that is why we must take this as something of great value ordained of God so let us with that turn ourselves to Ephesians chapter 1 will you help me go through this however long it's going to take I don't know how long this could take sometimes I look at it and I think this could take a year then I look at it and think it could take 10 years um, me and Chris were debating that in my kitchen um, about two weeks ago and we disagreed but when we get to like just verses like chapter 7 in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace I think we need to stop there for a number of weeks a number of weeks in this verse today verse 4 just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love that's the verse I want to read to you though the first 14 verses Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ verse 1 by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory father now would you attend the preaching of your word not that a preacher might be exalted but christ may be heard and seen and glorified all teachers we ask in the name of jesus amen verse 4 then Verse 4a, the first part of this, this great verse, just as he chose us in him 
before the foundation of the world. One thing I hope that you'll remember is last time we kind of had a little bus tour. Remember, we, we got on the bus and we, we had a tour. We asked of ourselves, what are these spiritual blessings to which we hear in verse 3? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. We, that's where we were. That's where we kind of began. That was the station to which we now set off in, or from. We firstly need to and did acknowledge that we are a blessed people. We are blessed that God in his goodness has given to you and I, given to us, so many blessings. Our homes, our families, our jobs, our income. The list could go on and should go on. The food we eat, the pleasures of blessings of recreation, fun, family, rest. Again, that list could go on and should go on all good things we would com completely acknowledge I trust this morning that all good things are from the Lord Acts 14 17 says nevertheless he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food and with gladness interesting isn't it how they link those two together Certainly a testimony of my home, food often is followed by gladness. God gives us good things all the time. We know and believe that, that God blesses us with all we need for life. Bread on our table, friends, family, sunshine, cooked grass, the smell of it, your fruit bowl, that fresh baked loaf. These are blessings from above. We also, though, acknowledge and we ought to remember that we as Christians are not the only ones who are blessed in this way. Remember? We know, the scripture tells us, we know and see that all God's creation receives blessings from the Lord. God is good, and God is good to all of his creation. Matthew 5, we mentioned last time, for he makes his son, I love how it says that, read that when you get home, his son, S-U-N, he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. He provides the earth full of goodness. There are people even now who reject the very thought of God, never mind the existence of Him, who today are receiving blessings from above. God is good to all creation. And God will continue to be that until He wraps it up and pours out His wrath on the unbelievers. So even, even as we use that, that, that word that's not used anymore, but even, even the reprobate experience and receive these blessings from the Lord. God is a good God to all of his creation. That's established. We know that. We believe that. The Bible teaches us that. But we must begin, as Paul does here, to make a distinction. There is a distinction. We know all creation receives blessings from the Lord, but something is different for God's own. There is something different for God's own. It is here, as we glance and work our way through this first chapter, chapter of Ephesians, that Paul makes this distinction. Here we see there are spiritual blessings. Spiritual blessings. And we who are Christ's have this. We, this morning, if you are Christ's, we have this. Remember, we go back four or five weeks or four or five sermons to the saints who are at Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. This is the letter to them. This is the letter to you this morning. That you are recipients of God's goodness and you are recipients of the spiritual blessings 
Not one and the other, or you got a bit and she's got a bit. You have every spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. And that, remember, is the very motivation, at least in part, that I would go through this first chapter, and God within second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, that we might, in today, in our culture today, as Christians, know who we are in Christ Jesus. Who are we in Christ Jesus? Well, friends, one thing that can be certainly said and early noted is that we have these spiritual blessings. You not earned them. God has lavished them upon you. God is a giving God. And He has given you every spiritual blessings. We must admit, though, I'm, I'm sure that we can c confess this together, that though we know these things, we are often found guilty, sadly too many of us are found guilty, of concentrating on those, those, those things that are only temporal. Our minds, me and Joy were talking about this yesterday as we were preparing lunch for Norman Santos today, that, that, that I'm 41. I am, nearly. And, and we, were, we were talking about all that's took place in these last 12 months. We've nearly been living here nearly 12 months. That happened a year ago, Mark. 12 months. We, and, and if we were to open this room up for conversation now, some of you are saying, I'm 80, I'm, I'm fill the gap. How life goes, yet how guilty, I, I'm confessing sin, how guilty we trans transfix ourselves, fixate ourselves on, on that which is temporal. I'm not saying all those things aren't bad. We've got to manage our life, pay the bills, pay the mortgage, all the rest of the things. But friends, in 40 years' time, it's likely that I might be in the grave. I've spent so much percentage of it thinking about whether I own, own a house or not, whether I pay for the car or not. To what extent? To what extent, friends? We have spiritual eternal blessings, not only when we see him, now, now we have blessings. What are those? Again, remember, we got on the bus and we took a bit of a tour. We didn't get off, but today we're going to get off. But those things are, those spiritual blessings are all that Paul goes on in those first 14 verses. And it is this, we are a chosen people. We are made holy and blameless before him in love. We are predestined into sonship. We are accepted in the beloved. Accepted in the beloved. Again, I can't wait to get there. We are accepted in the beloved. Man will reject you, not God in heaven. He has accepted you. He has redeemed you. He has then, verse 7, forgiven you. Recipients, you are, saint, you are recipients of an inheritance. Not might be, as this will been written for me. Yeah, it's been written, all right. It's been written in the blood of the Lamb and sealed by the Spirit of God. It is yours. We'll get there. And then we, as I said, we are sealed as God's own. These, friends, are our spiritual blessings. Then today, we again, as I've said, as I use that analogy, we, we stop this bus now and we're going to jump off for a while and we're going to look at, at, for two weeks at this one verse and we're going to split it into two. And the first is this just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, and then God willing, next week it will be the reason for that choosing that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. I said to Nick last week when we were traveling, that's when I could get a word in. Um, that are how many sermons could you choose out of this? Um, could be many, but I will, with God's help, seek to do it in two. 
Friends, the depth and the truth of the sweetness of this blessing in this verse are amazing. And they're everything, if I'm being honest, that has been revolutionary in my own Christian life that gives me assurance, that makes me rest, that makes me know that this is not about me. Amen. Will you humbly come with me for the next 30 minutes? Stop, get off the bus, leave your presuppositions there, bring your backpack and travel with me and see what does this mean? In Him. It is all in Him. Just as He chose us in Him. One of the things that can happen when tackling a verse like this is we have a mindset that these kind of verses, they don't really matter too much. There is so many who have differing thoughts and opinions. So it must be then best left alone. We don't want to cause division. I remember Nathan mentioned me a story of his experience when he preached on this very same thing, that it caused havoc within the church. I don't think that it will happen here because I know that you are mature saints seeking to know and have your eyes and your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of his grace according to the inheritance in the saints. So, for some reason, we don't like this topic. I don't put myself in that group. I love it. Election. Predestination. Being chosen. Let us not be like that. Let us be learners. Let, let us humbly be submitted to the Word of God. Let us with our whole being be saying this. What saith the Word? What saith the Scripture? One of the things, I've got to admit this, I've got to say this to you, one of the things in our, in our Christianity of today which is predominantly dispensational, there is this, which then attached to that, predominantly within that, there's an Arminianism within that, but within dispensationalism they would make an argument between the huge distinction between the Jews and the church. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going down that road, at least not today. But what they would say is that Israel are the chosen people of God. So we have this denial of being chosen, yet a fundamental belief that there is a, there is a chosenness. It is actually problematic in their own theology. One thing is explicitly clear in Scripture... And what a huge point that Nathan made on his session on soteriology, that being the means of salvation, is that God is a choosing God. We serve a choosing God. It's, 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 it amazes me that, that we think that God has no right to choose, yet we have every right to choose whatever we shall so do and desire. Bear with me and stay with me. God is a choosing God. I quote Nathan himself. He said, everything God does, he chooses to do so and do it freely. Without compulsion, there is nothing that doesn't flow from the free choice of God. I am going to convince you this morning that God chooses. Amen. We therefore must concede that God is a choosing God. God chooses. God has chosen. Okay, what has He chosen? Again, this is in no way exhaustive. If it were, I'd be longer than you would wish me to be. Therefore, I cannot be. But I will touch the very tip of the iceberg. God chooses to do... Dot, 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 dot. Create and fashion the world. God chooses to create and to fashion and to continually maintain the world. Again, I don't think I'm going to have much argument there. God, not by compulsion, but freely of his own choice, create, decided 
or chosen or chose to create the world. Did he have to do that? He didn't have to do that at all, did he? He was, remember, if you think about the triune God, he was in, they were in sweet fellowship with one another. But then they said, let us create. To create male and female. Now, though, in this perverse and corrupt generation, we have this claim of more than, I don't know how many genders, never, never mind. But God, in his wisdom, he fashioned it for himself that he would choose to create male and female. Amen? That's what he chose to do. He created male and female. What else did he choose to do? He chose to have or create birds and four-footed animals. He chose to do that. It pleased him to do that. It was good that he did that. He chose to do that. Do you know what else he chose? This is profound. He chose the sea to be blue. Don't go all scientific on me. As in it's, it's blue as we look at it. And it's green. The grass is green. He chose to do that. Have you ever thought about, can you imagine if the grass was red? Have you ever even wasted your own time and energy and thought, can you imagine? Can't comprehend it, really. God chose to do as he saw, wise and fit and good. God chose for the sun to warm the day and the moon to be the light of the night. God chose to do that. He chose, didn't he? If you remember, and if you are Bible readers, you will know that he chose to reveal himself to Abraham and make a nation from him. Now, if you say he didn't choose to, you're going to have to have a counter-argument and tell me, or tell your own heart, that he was compelled to do that by some external way or some other external being. He chose to do that. He chose, didn't he? In his wisdom, I would say in his humility, to reveal the very oracles of God to Israel. You ever looked at a map? Sure you have. And you look at the nation of Israel, a tiny little dot, almost central to everything. Yeah? He chose to do that. God chose to do that. He chose to speak to his people of old through the prophets. He chose to speak through men who he chose... Did he not choose Jeremiah and Nahum and David and Samuel to be his servants? He is a choosing God. He chose to do that. He chose the cross as a means of the death of his son. Yeah? Acts 2, 24, predetermined. He chose to do that. At the right time, God sent his son. He chose to do that. Okay, again, I in no way think that it is in any way exhausted, but it, what I wanted to do is provoke your mind to think on these things. God is a choosing God. We see clearly that God, who is the God of all wisdom, is a God who chooses. Listen to the psalmist in Psalm 115, verse 3. But our God is in heaven, who does... Whatever he pleases. He does whatever he pleases. Okay, let us stay and think on that just for a moment. I think we ought to be honest here. Some of us may not like that. The thought of a God who does as he pleases. The thought of anyone doing as one pleases is a constable thought. Uncomfortable thought. I didn't say comfortable, uncomfortable. Do I want, do what I want, when I want, is in, is in no way something that is attractive. Yet, saints, we have a God who does as he pleases. He does as he pleases. Is there a phone going on? Bless you. He does as he pleases. God does as he pleases. That's what the psalm says, 115 verse 3. But our God is in heaven who does whatever he pleases. We can tend to fall this way and say, I, I, I don't know if I like that. Let's be honest. If we're going to be learners, if we're going to be, if we're going to be people who, who work these things out, let us just, just be honest and say, I'm not sure at times if I like that. He does as he pleases. 
And we don't like it at times because we think God as being like you and I. That's what we think. That is our measuring stick. You see, if I were to do as I please, it would be completely dangerous. It would be dangerous if I did as I please. The reason for that is because I am a sinful being. Affected by the fall, I am prone to many things, certainly prone to selfish ambition and the like. But be assured, friends, that God, the God who does as he pleases, is a God who is only ever good. He is only ever good. Whatever God has chosen to do is good. It is for his own glory and for the very honour of his own name. Not only that, but it is for our good. It is for our good. We will, we will get there, won't we? When we get, but where, where is it? it in, in him we also obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. All things. I'm going to say it again. All things. Let that drip into your mind and into your heart. God who does whatever he pleases is a God who is good. We cannot but quote Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. You want to use that phrase as I do, but I want to ask you with real seriousness, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Do you, do you apply that? This is the thing, you see, we're in, again in a conversation as, as we open this book up. Do we believe? We need, we might, we've got this doctrine, it's all right me standing before you today to which I'm trying to, to talk to you about the chosenness or the election or predestination and having it as some trophy on my bookshelf as, and that's what I believe. Friends, that's not the real essence of all of this. The essence is that you can live this Christian life in the very knowledge of your Saviour. Okay, let me, let me go on. God is a choosing God. In every detail of life, both that in the sphere of the world and all things in it, and then the very personal detail of our own lives, trusting and knowing that all, is the, all of this is for our good and for His glory. So when we look at our text, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, we then must see that this choosing applies to salvation. This means, this is the means, the means to which you were saved. It's essential for you to, to think on that. This is the means to which you were saved. I'm going to say it again. This is the means to which you were saved. Just as he chose you in him before the foundation of the world. Stay with me. Let me read the language and of the scriptures Psalm 33 12 blessed is the nation who God ch whose God is the Lord the people he has chosen as his own inheritance now those and again I, if you are dispensational you are going to adamantly tell me and you'd be right in this by the way that you were adamantly going to tell me that God chose the Jews so we're going to say and admit that God is a choosing God you can't, some of us will struggle to then put into New Testament principle. So then you have to say, as it, as it may be dispensationalist or not, well, God was a choosing God in the Old Testament. My, my Bible says God doesn't change. Yeah. Okay. Psalm 65, verse 4. Blessed is the man 
you choose and cause to approach you that he may dwell in your courts we shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house of your holy temple friends I had probably about 150 plus scriptures to pick from I've picked four Peter 1 Peter Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontius Galatia Cap Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you, and be mortified, multiplied. John 15, the very words of Christ, if you were of the world, the world would love, the world loves its own, yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. What we then see is that the choosing is on God's part. We cannot but refer to our text, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. There is the choosing, the choosing, Think about it. Choosing. It is this. It's a divine act of God. It is a sovereign divine act of God. God's cho choice of individuals to salvation before the foundation of the world rested solely upon God's own sovereign will. You've got to stay with me. <coughs> stay with me. Because what you're going to be thinking, at least maybe some of you, and I thought it, thought it. This is not fair. This, this, is, this is not the God that, that I think I know. This is, this, is, this is not fair. I would join you, and I will say from this pulpit, it's not fair. It's not fair. Then what are you saying? I ask you to stay with me. I would say that it's not fair, and I would say such a statement would be 100% theologically correct. It's not fair. It's not fair. But let me say this, friends. Hear me, please. You and I don't want what is fair. You and I don't want what is fair. I don't know whether you stay with me. I trust you are. Because what is fair is for God who is holy, God who is righteous, God who cannot look at sin, God who we cannot comprehend, who is glorious, who is the creator of all things, who is only ever God. Would be right and be just to condemn every human being into hell for all eternity. You see, if we get fair, we don't get grace. If we get fair, we do not get lavished upon and be recipients of mercy. Let me say, with, with great clarity, saints, brethren, sisters in the Lord this morning, there is no injustice with God. Not an ounce of injustice. In the choosing of sinners to salvation, there is not one microcosm of injustice. I believe this is fundamental to understanding the full counsel of God. I do. Why? As I've said already, for the judge of all the earth to damn every sinner into outer darkness would be just and right. The Word of God says that. The wages of sin is what? The wages of sin is death. For God to pay those wages to everyone would be a good 
act of God. Doing exactly what is just. I remember, Tom, you won't mind me mentioning it. If you do, it's too late. When we were going through premarital counsel, marriage counsel, uh, we normally just discuss things like this. You see, if we were, Mark, we were to get your minibus and we were to travel to prison, Nottingham prison, and we were to go into that, and we had been, we had been commissioned by the king, and you can fill your minibus. These condemned sinners, you can fill that minibus, which holds, what, 11 people. And we go in, commissioned by the king himself, with the authority of the king, to go in there and release 11 prisoners. You see, what has took place? 11, 11 of them have received the mercy. The rest of the prison have received justice. You see, there's no injustice with God. None at all. None whatsoever. The wages of sin is death. You see, brethren, if we can get that, if we can really look then to the fall and see that in Adam, again, those great doctrines of Romans 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, that in Adam all are dead. If we can say, if we can pronounce, announce and diagnose that mankind in Adam are sinful, that every human being that's ever lived deserved the full weight of a holy God upon them, we will get this. Romans 3, 9 through 12, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have previously charge both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin as it is written there is none righteous no not one there is none that understands there is none who seeks after God they have all turned aside they have together become unprofitable there is none who does good no not one men mankind are guilty before a holy God without hope the sentence upon us is the right sentence, friends. Death. You see, we, we have a huge problem. I believe that. We have a huge problem. We might not articulate it like I'm about to, but I think I'm right when I say much of the church today see mankind as a victim. That's a problem. They see mankind as a victim, a poor man who just needs a little bit of help. If they would only just receive Jesus, then their life would be complete. Friends, let me say this with all humility. I trust with all grace this would not be true, and it certainly would not be apostolic doctrine. I know I repeat myself, but I must. All men everywhere in every generation deserve death. To be cast out, remember... This, is, this needs a sermon. Anyone, I'll challenge you to, to preach on this. Cain, remember what Cain said? What did Cain say when he was cast out? My punishment is more than I can bear. You deserve that. I deserved that. Get that right, you get the gospel right. If you can this morning agree with the reality that men in their sin are justly condemned, then you will arrive that in order for men to be saved, there needs to be a divine intervention. And that begins with God's own choosing to save some to himself. That's not fair. You're right. But it is this, it is grace, and it is mercy displayed and bestowed from a God who is good and does as he pleases. I hope you can now have some sympathy why we have to spend two, three sermons on one verse. Because this is high, and this is weighty, this is beautiful. This choosing then, as Paul says, is in him. It's in Him. You see, the divine choice is made in Christ. We can receive nothing apart from Christ. 
all things are in Christ. Remember, all things were made by him and for him. The grass on your garden, the leaves on the trees of your garden, the, the, the hair on your face, it all hangs upon Christ. It's all in him. Everything is moved and shaped in him. In him we live and move and have our being. It's all in him. Everything is in him. All things are in Christ. Christ, friends, you know this, you know it well. Christ achieved our salvation. He achieved it. He did it. In his life, oh, and in his death, we were saved. In the choosing and the means of salvation. That being that Christ would be the substitutionary sacrifice. Bearing the wrath of God in the place of sinners. You can understand, can't you, why Paul, in many of his letters, emphasizes this. In him. In him. It is then in this we were saved, and in him we were chosen. One commentator puts it like this, everything in creation comes from Christ. Everything is subject to his sovereign election. He is the foundation and origin and executor. All that is involved in election and its fruits depend on him. Jesus, who became sin for us and a curse for us, bearing the inconceivable pain and separation from the Father for us, is the agent and facilitator of the Father's choice. In Christ we were chosen. As we took place, as this took place, says Paul, all of that in Christ, it all took place when before the foundation of the world. Now if you have an argument, don't argue with me, argue with the text. This took place before the foundation of the world. Again, let it be known that this was not some random act. Imagine if God was a God who acted randomly. Again, I do that, you do that. God does not do that. How do we know that? Being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his own will. Oh, he's a great planner. Some of you are great planners. God is a planner. It's not a random act. And it certainly was not a plan B. This was not God sending his son then hoping some might believe. Imagine. Imagine that. God throws his fishing net into the pond and hopes some might come. Please. Not my God, not my Savior. Not the God of the Bible. This was a predetermined plan of God to save a people for himself. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14 reads this, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel, for the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Calvin says this, the very time of our election shows it to be free. Think about that for a second. The very time of our election shows it to be free. For what could we have deserved or in what did our merit consist before the world was made? You say I did something good, you're wrong. You say that God looked down somewhere and he thought yeah, that easy could, no, no, you're wrong. God had a plan. God had a people. And they were all chosen in Christ. The question then, and as we've said so many times, as we make our way through Samuel and as we seek to be exp expositors, so that we don't just jump over texts like these 
and don't give this food for your soul. The question is, is this important? That's the question. It's the question I'm going to finish with. Is this important? At the end of the day, you'll determine that for your own life. Some will say, it's not so. Some will say with a presupposition, well, that's Calvinism. Some will say it's semantics. Some will say, just give me Jesus. What Jesus? I want to say this. Dear beloved, don't pass over this doctrine. For if you do, you miss something significant. And the significance is this. That he loved you before time was. Children, Christians, children, yeah, why not? Christians, will you allow the truth of this doctrine to seep into the very vessel of your soul? That there has never been a time to which God has not loved you. Never. There has never been a time, saint, never been a time when God has not loved you. This, remember, is a God who does as he pleases. And what pleased him was to set his love upon you before all eternity. But what verse 5 says, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Why? Because it pleased him. It pleased him to love you. You see, this is vital that we don't pass over. Do you know that God loves you? See, we don't, we don't talk about the love of God enough. We don't. Do you know that God loves you? God loves you. Do you know that he's always loved you? He's always. See, this is what motivated all this. I would say, though we could theologically say there's more, for his own glory, yep. Yep, you'd be right. Because it pleased him, yep. Uh, you'd be right. But while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. It, it was good. It was the goodness and the love of God that motivated this. You did. He loves you. He loves me. He has always loved you. He has a plan. You see, we have these terminologies in the contemporary church that he has a plan for us. You know what? They're right. He's got a plan for us. And he's always had a plan for us because he predetermined you. He has eternally set his love upon you. Hallelujah. That's the glory of this theology. That's the glory of this doctrine. Just flicking through the book we were reading on um, whenever it was, Thursday. Jeremy Walker says this, the beginning of God's gracious purpose carries us back before the beginning of the world. So many Christians are almost, they think they're some kind of, and forgive me for using this terminology, I have no better one, but they're like some kind of spiritual one night stand. As if there's some mistake. As if they just stumbled. Let me be assured, if you are even in here this morning, believer or not, you were determined to hear this message. God determined that you would hear this message. All things for the counsel of his own will. Friends, let me convince you of something. I don't stand here trying to convince you all to become thoroughbred Calvinists. Whatever that means. But rather, oh, much more, much more than having an ism attached to some name. It's irrelevant in many ways, friends. But rather that you might realize and grow in all wisdom and understanding the revelation, you know, having your eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. 
Again, I go back to that statement I made weeks ago. I am convinced we don't know who we are in Christ Jesus. You see, I see it amongst us here in the life of this church. I see fear. I see wavering amongst us, doubt, lacking of assurance. Lacking assurance because you think you've got something to do. You think you've got something to add. Am I saved? Aren't I saved? I'm saved today because I read, I read half of Ezekiel. That's how we measure things. As if, as if that saves me. As if preaching this sermon saves me. As if me being the pastor of this church saves me. None of that saves me. My saving grace is in Him. In Him. I hang in Him because He loved me. Amen. That's the truth of the gospel. Because he loved you. This is not some Calvinistic reform sermon. This is the Bible being opened up to your very soul. Because it says in him. He chose us in him. Work it out. Before the foundation of the world. Why do I bring this? Because the Bible brings it. And I want you, every one of you. Whether you've been a Christian since 1980. Whether you've been a Christian, even in this moment, you're thinking, I want the Lord. Be assured that He predetermined you. Pre be assured that He put His love upon you from the very foundation of the world. You know what? I don't understand it. After an hour of trying to convince you, I don't understand it. But I know that God has a people. And He loves you. You see, this should be the bedrock of a great confidence and assurance for you. That a God who has eternally loved you when He only existed will never leave or forsake you. Yes, but I did. Oh, you did. You did. We did. To our shame, we did. Yeah, we did. But he didn't forsake his own. Why? Because he loved you from the foundation of the world. Brethren, whether storm, tide, wind, rain, the one who chose you shall keep you. Amen.